What's up, everyone? Welcome to another collective challenge. I'm so happy to have Kevin Perry here with me. Woo! That's your audience clap. Um, <laughs> you're an amazing, talented stop motion artist, VFX artist. So um, let us know a little bit about what you do, the types of videos you make, and then we'll hop in to the epic challenge that we have for you guys out there today. Yeah, so like you mentioned, I'm a stop motion animator and visual effects artist. Um, so I split my time between um, stop motion animation, which is moving <laughs> objects a little bit at a time, um, and then the other half is visual effects, so um, video magic, optical illusions, that kind of thing. When I was perusing your Instagram and seeing all the VFX that you do, my first question is, how do you even get the ideas for this? So a few examples is you're reaching across into your mirror and playing catch with yourself. You are disappearing when you're jumping into a pool. It's crazy stuff, but where does that idea even stem from? A lot of it comes from looking at objects. So mirrors, pools, um, you know, toys and objects and stuff, and just thinking, what can I create from that object? How can I make something impossible from that? Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your stop animation workflow and maybe the difference between when you're working with puppets uh, versus maybe real humans. Because that's what our challenge here is, is you want to use stop motion with you, your friend. Yeah, so a puppet is lifeless. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're animating a puppet, everything has to come from you. So you're animating the hips, the chest, the eyes, the hair, the fingertips, um, and that all has to come out of your head. And you have to create a performance from nothing, one micro movement at a time. <laughs> um, whereas if you're animating with a person, um, you know, they can help you, they can create the performance by themselves. Um, you know, they know what it is to move, they can figure out how to walk. Um, so that's pretty big difference. Do you have any advice for the people doing the, the challenge when you're interacting with people? I mean, are there certain things to look out for? Like, oh, you want to keep everything still and maybe move one limb at a time. Or for someone who has no idea how to do stop motion, what would be the, the tips you would give them? Yeah, definitely stillness um, is a big factor. You kind of want to think bigger picture, like there is a minutia to it and controlling little elements, but think big picture, you know, what's the big movements going through space? Um, what are the big movements happening from the limbs and the body? The movie Missing Link, can you talk a little bit about that? Because when I was watching the clips from it, it's so impressive, the stop motion animation. And like you said, when you're not working with people, you have to come up with all of those things on your own. So. How do you transfer what's in your brain to a, a character? Yeah, so uh, just to take a step back, so I've worked on feature animated films. So I worked on uh, The Box Trolls, Kubo and the Two Strings, um, and Missing Link, which just came out. Um, and developing a performance in a puppet, it mostly comes from two parts. So you'll listen to the voice actor, so you have their voice performing, and you also have the storyboards drawn out what the character should be doing. Um, and you kind of put those together and most of the time, I would just listen to the voice actor over and over, just a hundred times, and in my head start to picture what that performance is. And I'll put headphones on, listen, and I'll just start acting it out myself. And I've posted videos like that. Um, and you just develop it until it feels completely natural. When I saw those videos, for some reason, I thought that you, you were the voice actor too. And I was like, <laughs> I am so impressed by yeah. Kevin right now. Well, you listen to it so many times <laughs> yeah. that you, you know how to hit those beats. Yeah. And it's crazy because you are acting. Have you ever had an urge to, hey, I want to go, you know, beyond behind the camera and step in front of the camera? Do, yeah, you, do you have that? It's a funny thing. Um, there's an old saying that animators are shy actors because <laughs> they want to act, but they don't want to be on camera. That makes sense. And that's, that's totally me. Um, I grew up completely shy, introverted. Um, so it's super strange that I do this on camera. Um, and Getting comfortable with that is just something that's happened over time. Um, one of my first jobs out of school, um, I had to uh, animate the scene and the director, I was in an edit with the director and like 
the DP's there, my boss is there, like all the heads are there. He had an audience. Yeah, and we're watching the scene and he's like, well, act it out for me. He's like, sit on the floor and act the scene out for me. And I'm like 20 years old, <laughs> sitting in front of all these like Hollywood bigwigs. And he's like, he's like, you're not feeling it. You're not feeling it. And like, I'm on the floor, like wow. trying to act it out. What did you have to act out? What was the scene? Um, it was a character like fiddling around with his hands and like wriggling around. Um, so you get put in those positions in your job and quickly you learn to just kind of get rid of that, you know, people are watching me. Um, kind of thing. You get, you get super comfortable making a fool out of yourself. How have you evolved personally through having this job and having to put yourself out there? You, you know, you said you grew up as a shy kid. Yeah. Has that changed things? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. I feel much more comfortable, um, you know, in public settings on camera. Um, yeah. I've given talks to, you know, like crowds of like thousands of people mm -hmm. and I feel much more comfortable than I could ever have imagined. For the people out there that might uh, be in a similar position, like, hey, I'm really shy, but I want to be creative. I want to take that step. What's some advice that you would have for, for people like that? I would say there are just different ways to be extroverted or express yourself. You know, people often think, you know, the extroverted person is the one who owns a room and puts on a show in front of a bunch of people and the shy person's in the corner not wanting to. But, you know, my version of being extroverted is being on camera and talking. I'm still in a room by myself, but that's my way of expressing myself. So there's a whole spectrum of, you know, being shy and expressing yourself. I think a lot of people are shocked when I'll call myself introverted because I charge by being, recharge by being alone. Exactly. And so I think it's really how you define it, right? Like I'm great being in a room, but after a conference, I'm not gonna see anyone for like an entire week. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah. I'm done with all of yeah. you people. Um, can you talk a little bit about working on feature films and what that's been like? And then we'll talk about your transition into social media. Yeah, so feature films, it's just so many people um, with specialized positions. So you have hundreds of people and they all have one little thing that they do. So on feature stop motion animation, there's people who only make little hair. There's like a person who knits tiny sweaters. There's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, um, that'd be amazing. <laughs> so I this, knit sweaters. Yeah, <laughs> they, you have this team of people who just do these really specialized things in it. As an animator, you have all of that support. Um, as an animator on feature films, you're so spoiled because <laughs> there's specialized equipment and rigs in stop motion. So if I need a character to jump and soar through the air, I can get a machine built that will control them along that path. Um, so what does that look like? Do you have that machine in front of like a green screen and then that arm is going to be mapped out? Exactly. Yeah, it gets erased. Okay. Yeah. And does the machine, is it mechanical? Do you have to physically oh, move it? A lot of things are mechanical with winders. Um, so it'll be like XYZ winders with, it's like a bar with teeth on it. And you're just turning dials and they'll move a little this way, move a little that way. Wow. <laughs> so a typical scene. Say you're animating three people in one scene. It's maybe 30 seconds of dialogue. There's a fair amount of movement. Can you estimate how much, how much time that would take for us? First of all, a 30 second shot in stop motion is pretty unheard of. Okay. There's very few 30 second shots. 10 second shot. Yeah, so a 10 okay. second is even slightly above average, but it- Really? So why is that? Is that just film in general? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit more fast paced. Yeah. Um, and yeah, on feature films, you're doing 24 frames per second. And a good day is maybe one second per day. Um, so at, yeah, a 10 second shot would be somewhere between, somewhere closer to two weeks of animation. One second <laughs> per day. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So obviously this job requires patience. And when you're working with a team, I can imagine that uh, it, it might be a little bit of hurry up and wait. Do you have to wait for that department to give you a certain thing before you can do your thing? What is the workflow in between departments with people? What is that like? Yeah, so when you're launched on animation, you're alone on set for as long as you need to animate. So everything has to happen beforehand. So okay. it's a ton of planning and then go time. Um, so anything you need to make the shot happen, whether it's rigging or machines, like that all has to be planned before, put on set, 
and then you're launched, animation goes, and you're alone. And forgive me for getting nitpicky, but I find this so fascinating. When do, when do the voices come into play? Is that the first thing that's recorded by the yeah. actors? Yeah, the voices are fairly early on okay. um, because they need to edit those into a story reel um, to have to plan the animation. Okay. Yeah. In animation, there's no two shots of anything. There's no extra footage. Every shot is shot to length with maybe 10 frames at the start of the end, but you need to have all your shots planned out for the whole movie beforehand. Interesting. So what is the, are you involved in uh, post-production at all or is literally everything that you are shooting? Of course, they have to map out things, um, but are you the person who's sitting there and moving every single, you know, every single millimeter? And then are you involved at all in the, in the post-production of it? No, so on feature films, you do really have one very specific job. So my job as an animator would be to get on set, move everything through the shot, and then step away, it's handed off to post-production. So you have hopped full in into social media, and I'm sure that is a change of pace. So um, let me know a little bit what your day-to-day -day is now with coming up with concepts. Recently, you carved how many pumpkins? 15. Okay, for, for this amazing stop animation, maybe describe that a little bit, but it's definitely a change of pace, right? It is, yeah. So doing social media full-time, especially stop motion, it's now I'm completely alone in creating this stuff. So I've gone from elaborate machines helping me animate to using like toothpicks and scotch tape. <laughs> you just use whatever materials you can find to, to make, prop things to up make things happen. And... Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of that. Um, and so my process. So say, say this pumpkin animation. Yeah. So the idea was using an individual pumpkin for each frame of animation. So it's I carved 15 pumpkins and it's the shape change from a cute jack-o-lantern to like a scary jack-o-lantern um, and each frame is a new carved pumpkin. That must have taken so long. How long did that take you? Yeah, that was uh, two days of carving Okay. Pumpkins. I imagine that's a little messy too. Very messy. Yeah. So tell me some other objects that, that you're doing similar things. You like to um, do it with fruit as well. Yeah, I've done fruit where I've um, every frame just sliced a tiny sliver off of the fruit um, so you see this pattern inside exposing. What types of fruit were those? <laughs> I'm, I'm generally curious in this process. Well, I've done because apples, <laughs> I've done apples and pears. <laughs> Oranges. Um, but, because, okay, in my brain, I'm like, I guess it's just the way you think, the type of person you are um, to come up with these concepts. But do you do better when maybe a brand approaches you and says, hey, here is the problem we need to solve. How do we get there? Or do you do better with just you in your room? Okay, what's my next stop animation? It's a little bit of both. Um, I really get inspired when brands approach me. Um, when they say, this is our product, you know, this is the object, and this is the story we want to tell with it, that's super inspiring to me. Um, I love problem solving how to get their message across. Um, that really guides me in like the storytelling of creating a video. Um, and then the stuff I do personally, it's, I'm kind of just doing, it's like eye candy stuff, like the fruit slicing, the jack-o-lantern. It's just something pretty to look at um, that I know could make a splash on social media. Do you have a favorite platform of the social medias? Um, I think Instagram is probably my favorite. Um, YouTube has been a bit difficult for me because you know, stop motion doesn't lend well to longer form content. <laughs> but you're doing it. So, yeah. so how do you approach a YouTube video? Um, you know, what's the difference between that and some of the Twitter, Instagram, TikTok platforms? Yeah, so most platforms I can share the short little piece of animation. The final product. Yeah, yeah, but YouTube I have to get into longer form. And I've been doing this series lately um, called Can I Animate? Where I did Can I Animate a Pumpkin? And so that's the theme of the video. And I challenge myself, can I animate this? Um, and it's the story of idea to final product. That's cool. What are some of the tools that you personally use now that it's just you? I, I see that you use a Wacom tablet, but in yeah. terms of post-production, for someone who has no idea what they're doing in, in the stop motion animation world, where do they start? Because <laughs> selfishly, I'm asking, where do yeah. I start? You can honestly start with your, your smartphone and any object. Um, you know, stop motion is just taking an object, 
uh, you know, take a picture, move it, take a picture, move it, do that a hundred times. <laughs> um, and you have not even one second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two seconds. Yeah. So with any smartphone and any object, you can create stop motion animation. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to get a bit more serious into it, there are products, you know, you have humanoid characters and they're called armatures. So it'll be a plastic or steel skeleton with controllable joints. Um, and yeah, you're just able to move them like micro mm -hmm. <laughs> movements like that. Um, so you can get into armatures like that. And then of course there's software and, and other uh, devices. Can you get a little bit specific with the software that you use, yeah. the, the gear that you use? Yeah, so I use Dragon Frame, it's called, and it's the industry st uh, standard software. And along with that, you'll get into um, keypads, which you wouldn't think, but it's an obvious tool. Um, so it's like a number pad on a, either Bluetooth or a cable. It's just so if your computer's way over there, you have this little keypad and you can like frame your animation and like look so at it. So you don't have to get up every time. Exactly, yeah. Interesting. A big part of stop motion is the physicality of that and the toll it takes on your body. Um, so if you're bent like this for 12 hours a day. I wouldn't even have thought about that. Yeah, so that's a huge part of it. Um, and they take that very seriously on feature films. Like you need to have the table at a comfortable level. You have to be like relaxed like this. There, people have destroyed their backs and like, um, is there like class yoga sessions that everyone's a part of? Yeah, I've been of? at studios where they have like lunchtime yoga <laughs> sessions. That's amazing. Yeah. So has it taken a toll? How long have you been doing this? Are you okay? <laughs> is your back okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Um, I, you know, I get some neck problems because like if you're animating and all day you're turned to one side, um, that can, yeah, that can. See, things I wouldn't have even thought about. Okay, so tell me about the fun part of animation. What inspires you? What gets you going? What, yeah. what are you inspired with right now? What is next for Kevin? Um, what inspires me about stop motion animation, and people often say, like, I can't imagine doing that. It takes so much patience. But I don't see it as patience. I see it as uh, problem solving. So like, if I'm trying to bring a performance to life, each frame is a piece of the puzzle for me. So every frame I'm trying to find that perfect position and perfect movement. Um, and when you're animating, there's this like kind of gut response to it where sometimes you'll move the puppet and you'll look at it and be like, oh, like I got it, that's it. Like I don't know why, but it's right and I'm like feeling the performance. So that's the part of it that really inspires me. That's awesome. Do you watch features? Do you watch old movies? What, what inspires you in terms of other people's art? Yeah, so I watch, um, I'm super inspired by silent comedians. Um, like, you know, Charlie Chaplin, uh, Buster Keaton. Um, and for me, that's just visual storytelling. Um, they didn't need to say anything, but they communicated amazing and hilarious ideas. And I say this all the time that with social media, for me, it feels like a resurgence of silent film. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most people watch videos on Instagram in line buying coffee. They don't have the sound on. I rarely turn the sound on while watching Instagram. So if I can create content without saying a word and communicate with an audience, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. Um, so moving on, not moving on, but stop motion is obviously a big part of your life, your creative process. And then there's this other side of the, the tricky, you, you called it magic, the VFX, where you watch it and literally my jaw will drop. I'll see it on Twitter. I'll send it to 20 of my friends. I'm like, how did he do that? Can you um, tell us maybe about a few of those videos, kind of like just... Let us know maybe some of your, your favorite ones that you've made. Um, and then I have some questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my favorite is probably the ping pong ball trick um, where I did this, yeah, I held this ping, I had this ping pong ball and I reach back and grab it and it's this giant ball. Um, and with visual effects, you can take a route where the visual effects are obvious um, but I like to do them in a way where, like you said, you have no idea how they're done. <laughs> I will watch those videos probably 20 times yeah. just trying to figure it out. So my, my approach with that, I'm super inspired by magicians. And so I kind of think of those videos um, like a card trick or like mm -hmm. a sleight of hand where, you know, a magician can do something right under your nose, 
and you're like, mm -hmm. how did that happen? It's happening right in front of your face. So if I can create a video where I'm doing a visual effect and you still, and you can watch it a hundred times and still not know how it happened, um, yeah, that's the approach I take. So how do you find the balance between the culture that we're in, where everyone's YouTube channels are telling people the secrets, this is how I did this, or watch, you know, this crazy visual effects, and then also keeping a little bit of the magic, because I'm sure you feel a little bit of pressure to be like, I'm gonna get 500,000 views if I just share this one secret, yeah. but then maybe that kind of dilutes the video, right? So how do you find that balance? Yeah, I, I have fallen into the trap of making longer form videos where I reveal uh, the secret. And I think lately I'm, I'm siding with not showing how it's done. Mm -hmm. I just love how people debate how, how things are done on the internet. Yeah. Like a hundred people could be wrong, but they'll still all argue with each right, other. Right. <laughs> so will you give away some things or some things just off limits and some things, oh, you know, this is easy, I'll share. It's masking, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't guard the secrets too much because it is all visual effects. There is no uh, magician's code <laughs> aspect to it. Um, and I'll also, I've found that some videos, if I leave in mistakes or messiness in the wrong spots as like a red herring to, mm. to get people off the scent <laughs> of how it's done, um, I'll play around with that a bit too. Interesting. So you kind of throw them off the scent by... Like I've done videos that loop, um, and you can imagine there's like the start and the end and they seamlessly loop. Um, we'll put the magic trick's in the middle of the shot, but I'll make the loop a little messy so people think that's where the trick is. <laughs> okay. Can you break down maybe one of the more simple ones for us that you can maybe share a little bit of the secret? And even if it is masking, talk to me like I'm five years old. <laughs> yeah. Um, so an easy trick I've done is um, I did one where I jumped into a pool mm -hmm. and I just vanish. Um, and so that one is literally two shots. I jump into the pool, cut, and then I start it again and just, I use a lot of uh, practical solutions. Mm -hmm. So that one I just took a water bottle full of water, took the label off, and when I filmed again I just threw it in so it would create a splash. And then when the water bottle went in it's just like you can't see it because it's clear. And so I just cut those two shots together and it looks like I vanished. Boom. Well, see, where do you even get that idea, the, the water bottle? Where does that even come from? So you're just thinking things practically, right? Exactly, yeah. Like 90% of what I do is just practical solutions. So I use a lot of um, fishing line to make things float, um, oh. things like that, yeah. I, I never want to use computer effects. Really? Yeah. Okay. So. You haven't revealed the ball one, right? So that's still. I did, yeah. did you? Okay, I did can a whole you tell behind us? the scenes. Okay, um, how? Thing how did it. you do that one? Can you break that down? Yeah, so quickly? that one was I had the ping pong ball. Yeah. And then the whole shot, there's this larger ball behind me. And I just erase it from the shot. Oh. And so when I hold the ping pong ball out, I drop it. And then I position my fingers. And then I grab the ball behind here. Yeah, and I, I erase out the ball dropping. Amazing. And so in that video, you can see my eyes are like not looking at the ball because right. I was watching my computer monitor to like line up where my hands were. And obviously these videos are fun because you're having fun with it. You know, you obviously inject your personality into it. Um, does it stay fun for you? I mean, a little context with videos. I love making videos, but when it's your job, Sometimes it really seems like your job, right? So how do you keep these things fun? Um, yeah, I, I tend to move on from ideas. Um, so when I get tired of making one type of content, I'll just, I'm like, okay, I'm done with that, onto something new. What's an example of one of those that you're like, I'm done? So I, on my YouTube channel, I have been doing, like for a year I did these videos where I perform, uh, they were called 50 Ways videos. So I would take an action, like oh. sitting in a chair and do it 50 different ways as a character. Wow. <laughs> um, and I've done like 30 of those videos. Um, and at the start, they were super exciting. I love them because it's all just silent performance. But after a while, it's like, okay, like doing the same thing over and over. And I still like doing them, but I want to try something new. 
Do you have a close relationship with your audience? Do you feel like it's the same people coming back or do you play more on the, like we were talking about Reddit earlier. Yeah. So it seems like you do have um, a very kind of mainstream audience that might come, you know, once every quarter because, oh, you hit a viral, you yeah. know, you went viral or something. Um, do you have a core audience that kind of follows you along with everything and wants to know all your secrets? How, how have you adapted to the world of social media and talking to strangers? Yeah, so I'm not exactly sure I have a core audience. There must be, like, there must be a core audience yeah. of people. Well, that like. I mean, he has millions of followers, <laughs> so yes. Um, but yeah, no, this has been a big part of my journey in social media. Um, when I quit my day job and started this about a year and a half ago, um, I thought, you know, how do I be successful in social media? Um, well, okay, I have to be a personality. I have to sell merch. Um, I have to do it like... <laughs> that's always the, I gotta sell merch yeah, now. <laughs> like, I was like, that's the way people do it. Right. Um, and that just didn't work for me. Um, I didn't have the personality. Like, I don't like... It, I quickly realized that wasn't the path for me. And I realized there's many different ways to be successful online. So I started taking more of a, like an animation studio approach mm -hmm. where... You know, I'm my own little studio. I make a video maybe once a month or every couple of months and release that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not quite, you know, sharing my life online or um, my day to day. It's great that you've found a cadence that works because I think people feel that pressure once a week, twice a week. Yeah. And with something so time consuming, it's almost impossible. Yeah. Right? I yeah, mean you have to do what works for your life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's a big point. There are many different ways to be successful mm -hmm. online. And I think it's so good to hear that this is a route and that, hey guys, you don't have to like not sleep. There, there are ways to um, really position yourself, like you said, as a studio, as almost a production house where I think sometimes people see working with companies as like not a good thing, but it's like, hey, most of the creative world is making uh, creative stuff for brands like yeah. that is their job so if in any way you can add your own personality your own personal twist to working with brands I think that's a really exciting place to be in yeah and I, I totally prefer working with brands mm -hmm. um, I've never really felt the pull to express myself <laughs> like I don't really want to share my story or express anything I need to say like I much prefer working with a brand and telling their story right that's, I mean, that's almost refreshing to hear because I too like a little, um, some barriers, right? When you're almost put in a box, it makes you be more creative. Yeah. Because you have certain things that, oh, okay, this is the goal. This is what I'm working with. Let's, let's see if I can get creative, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's no, there's no right or wrong path. Right. Um, it's just kind of what works for you. 100%. Let's bring it back to the very beginning. How did you get into this? Did you have siblings that were creative, parents? How did it all begin? So as a kid, I was super inspired by um, behind the scenes making of featurettes for movies. So I remember watching, uh, there was one for The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, and I just remember seeing like them sculpting and it was almost like they were playing with toys for a living. Um, I can imagine you sitting there as a kid, I want to do yeah, that. Yeah, like it's someone's job to move around these, <laughs> these uh, action figures. Um, so I remember watching that and being super inspired. And then also I watched a ton of uh, like monster makeup behind the scenes. So like people making fake blood and like sculpting, you know, monster makeup for horror movies. And I, that was, that was really the first point of inspiration for me. Mm -hmm. And then mix in, I watched a lot of um, like David Copperfield's TV specials. <laughs> and I had this very distinct memory watching his flying special in the early 90s. And it was like that Mary Poppins effect where like I was like standing on the coffee table after like, I you know, I think I can fly. Like David Copperfield, <laughs> yeah, he did it. Yeah. Um, and there's just that feeling of like, like that magic is real feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's carried on throughout my entire career. So what was your first project you ever did with VFX or stop motion? When I was getting into college, it was kind of when Pixar was like hitting their peak. Um, so that really pushed me into animation. Um, so I started experimenting with like 3D animation in high school. Um, and then 
from there, I just applied to animation schools. Um, so I went to college for animation. Amazing. And it was, was it was there like? where I discovered yeah. stop motion. Yeah. So what was that like going to school for something very creative? And were like, was your family skeptical? Because I know with anything, I mean, I was like doing engineering for my family, right? Like, don't worry about me. Um, did you feel any pressure to not go the, the arts route? I think... I mean, my family must have been a bit skeptical, <laughs> like animation, I don't know. But um, I was always very good. I was a very good student growing up. Yeah. So I always had a, a really good work ethic. So I think they trusted me that no matter what I would do, mm-hmm. I, would, I would put the effort in to make it work. So what was that first college project and working with people and learning? I bet that was exciting. Yeah, that was that was scary because um, I didn't get into animation or I wasn't interested in animation until I was a teenager, like kind of right before college. And so to be plopped in with a hundred other students who had been, they had like the Disney dream since they were five years old to like be Disney animators. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these, these people are serious. Yeah. Um, so it was very, very intimidating. And that was a big part of why I got into stop motion um, because no one else was. Um, like literally in my entire year of college, like my group that I was in, no one was doing stop motion. So I was like, this is the one thing I can do to stand out from everyone else. So it was a bit of a business play <laughs> to get into I it. mean, that's smart. And so what was the approach with uh, your you know, the professors, the people you were working with, um, did that help you build a community and then kind of right out of college? Were you doing what you wanted to do? No, so out of college, um, I, I got a job in computer animation, so not stop motion at all. Um, I guess backing up, my final year of college, I did a thesis film in stop motion, um, and that was what launched my career. So I think it was a month or two after I graduated um, my, my student film was like a, b- a bit dark um, and yeah, it was a month or two after and Tim Burton was coming to Toronto oh. for his, his uh, <laughs> modern art exhibit. Okay. And he was like, I'm not doing any publicity, but I'll do an event with students where I watch student films and chat with the students. And I was Did like, he watch your film? Yeah. Because wow. I was like, I was like, Tim Burton, I was like, I have a dark stop motion film. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so like a month or two after, I got to screen it for a theater and like stand on stage with Tim Burton and chat with him. I mean, I'm going to need more details. How did that go? Like, was, were you nervous? Did you say anything? I was super nervous. Were you just staring at him in awe? Yeah, so he watched it and then I got to ask him two questions. So I just got to go up on stage, shake his hand and ask a couple of questions. What did he say? Did he say anything about your film? Yeah, he said he really liked it. Um, he, he called it a mix between like 2001 and Rudolph, like the Rudolph special. (laughs) I really like that. So from that point, you're like, okay, I found my calling, I'm good. So you you move into your professional life and how was that um, going from college and now, you know, you do your feature films, um, but now that you've arrived and you're working kind of uh, on your own, do you find yourself longing to work with groups collaborate with other creators? Do you do um, any of that? Or is it kind of just, do you like being in your room for two days straight, you know? <laughs> Honestly, I like I like being alone and working yeah. alone. Um, yeah, you don't get into stop motion to like work with a team. <laughs> right. You do work with a team, but um, it is a type of personality where you're just content being alone for days or weeks and just like being hyper-focused on what's in front of you. I, I, I do enjoy collaborating, but um, I, I do really prefer working by myself. So with that, you probably have some good book recommendations, some audio books, some podcasts. What are you listening to these days? Because someone <laughs> who is alone in the room for hours and hours and hours doing meticulous work, you know, you, you're probably listening to some good stuff. Yeah. Well, I was listening to your podcast the other day while working. <laughs> that creative life? Oh, yes. really? Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, I put on, it's funny, I tend not to listen to new things. Um, There's kind of like a flow state to like listening to stuff you've heard before. Mm. Um, So I've done shots on features where I've listened to the same song literally on repeat for like eight hours. 
and it just gets you in the zone of like not knowing what time it is. Right. You don't know where, like where in right. space or time you are. Um, <laughs> okay, well, I'm curious. What would that one song be? It, de it depends on the day. Um, there'll be times when, you know, I'm so in it and like it's active and I'll put on like really aggressive music. Yeah. But then the second something starts going wrong, I'm like, nope, like throw the headphones off. Like I need complete silence. Okay. It's very... Um, like mood based. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stop motion animation has obviously been around for a minute, right? Um, but it's evolved in many ways that I'm, I'm sure you've seen the industry change. Um, what do you see as next for it? Do you see it as something that is precious and should stay the same? Is there a radically different future for it? It's hard to tell, but it is slowly merging with, um, you know, greater technology. So if you can imagine um, like stop motion classics from 50 years ago, like the stuff Ray Harryhausen was doing, you know, he had a film camera. He had no, he didn't, he couldn't see what he was animating. Um, so he had a film camera. He'd have to move the object, take the picture. Like he had no computer monitor, nothing. So he had to keep in his mind mm. what was happening. Like if you look at a phone or like, like look at an object on a table and tell me where it was 10 minutes ago, it's impossible. <laughs> so he had to keep that information in his brain. So as stop motion progresses, it's being assisted by technology. So now we have computer monitors to review the footage live so I can see my frames that I shot before. Um, and so these kind of computer technologies are assisting stop motion animation. And the biggest world it's pushing into is 3D printing. So on feature films, all the faces are 3D printed. Um, so they do the facial animation beforehand, and then when you're ready to do your shot, you have a box with hundreds of tiny faces. And you're like, okay, frame 40, this is the face for frame 40, put it on. And this is all being 3D printed. So uh, actually stop motion features are the leading user of 3D printed materials wow. out of any industry. Mm -hmm. And they're pushing like how to combine color combinations and how to like use different materials, like different plastics mixed with other materials. Um, so I'd say out of anywhere it's pushing into it would be 3D printing. What's special about stop motion opposed to just straight up computer animation? What makes it, you know, maybe a little bit more magical or, or what would you say the biggest difference in, in pro would be? Yeah, so stop motion animation, it's almost like theater. Um, because you have to start on frame one and just start moving the puppets and they just go where they want to go. Mm -hmm. um, there's no taking it back. You can't redo anything. You can't go back and edit anything. Um, yeah. it's, like, it's like a live performance happening at a snail's pace. <laughs> um, that's, that's the biggest difference. Yeah. Um, so in animation, that's, it's called keyframe animation versus straight ahead. So in computer animation, if you want to do a big performance, you'll get the keyframes down first. So the big poses, and then you'll work in between them and like kind of work it and you polish and polish and polish. Um, whereas stop motion is straight ahead. So frame one, frame two, you better frame know three, doing. frame four. Yeah. It's been amazing chatting with you, Kevin. Um, but why we are here is because of the stop motion challenge and it involves you. And tell us a little bit about the contest. And I'm excited, I might dabble a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, so the stop motion challenge is to create a piece of stop motion animation. And the only limitation is you have to use either yourself or a friend. So animate a person. It's just the easiest way to possibly create stop motion. And so the contest opens on November 18th. It closes on January 6th. And you're going to be watching these submissions. What are you looking for? I'll be judging on four categories. So animation technique, and that's how much you're exploring actually animating. Um, then I'll be looking at concept. So that's the big picture idea. Maybe you're telling a story, um, but what's the overall idea you're getting across? Um, then I'll be looking at creativity, and that's how you're using the limitation to your advantage. So what, how are you taking animating a person and turning that into something really cool? And then the last category is kind of extra flair. Are you going above and beyond or uh, incorporating things that I would never expect mm -hmm. to be used in this 
uh, challenge. Yeah. I'm so excited to see all the submissions. If you need some inspo, you can check out uh, Kevin's socials, Twitter, Instagram will be in the description below. And then when you're ready, go to collective.lacy.com slash stop motion challenge um, to submit your stop motion art. I'm so excited. You should really just click off this video at this point. You should check out the link. Thanks for uh, joining us.